Uh, thank you for considering what's happening in Egypt and the Arab Spring countries. Uh, there was two cases that I wish to, to discuss with you, one concerning a young Egyptian Coptic Christian named Albert Saber. Uh, this young man has been arrested, almost uh, kept in temporary uh, imprisonment for over a year pending trial for some statements he wrote on his Facebook account. Another case for as young as nine years old for a child has been arrested in prison for four days on the accusation of blasphemy. Where does common sense and international law starts and where does it end with regard to the age concern, with regard to how far can we go with freedom of expression? You said you worked with the rapporteur on freedom of expression in this area. However, what can your commission do with these states that are going through transformation at the time being? Okay. I mean, I think you had basically two questions. Uh, uh, the one question, what can we actually do? And what do we think about it? It's easier to say what we think about it than to come up, let's say, with uh, practical measures. Uh, but I tr let me try to, to say something on both regards. Now, first, of, let me start with um, uh, the conceptual component. I think those cases are evidence enough uh, w uh, about the problematic uh, consequences of blasphemy legislation because, I mean, they do have a chilling effect. And sometimes one thinks they are supposed to have a chilling effect on society, on society, and uh, uh, in particular against dissidents, uh, maybe also from the majority religion, uh, then minorities. Converts are just one more example. Uh, or uh, in, in, in the case that you mentioned, this Coptic Christ, I think he considers himself to be an atheist. That's also part of, uh, part of this, uh, the spectrum. Um, now, I would say from my perspective, freedom of religion or belief, freedom of religion or belief and freedom of expression closely belong together. They, clo they are not the same, otherwise, I mean, we could forget about one of those rights. They are not, not the same. But also freedom of religion or belief has a strong dimension of communication. Communication. Uh, so, uh, religious questions, and, uh, of course, there are issues often very deep to people's feelings, very deep to a person's heart, uh, and there is a, a, a sense of deep loyalty attached to religious questions. That some, sometimes those uh, discussions turn into a, an emotional conflict. But, and that's something we should, of course, allow to a certain degree, Emo even emotional conflicts. We should cultivate them. But uh, I would say it's also for the benefit of religious convictions that people can express what they think, can express sometimes their doubts, sometimes new ideas, sometimes maybe also strange ideas, but in a climate in which they are not afraid that this might trigger persecution. Maybe it triggers emotional reactions from others, but not state persecution. I think, uh, and that's why also religious uh, beliefs, uh, uh, their manifestations, their practices can best flourish in a society that allows for freedom of expression. So both are very strongly linked. So I can't even imagine a society to have freedom of religion without freedom of expression. I mean, the communicative component is so essential. It's so essential. Yeah, what can the UN do? I mean, transformation is a a complicated process and one thing is certain all the important changes must come from the people on the ground I think one should be modest also in the United Nations of course the United Nations can do something can coordinate capacity building can clarify norms can also convene discussions but I mean what really counts are infrastructural measures on the ground. So, and that's something that uh, the UN has invested in, uh, that made, made some investments in the, in the last years, uh, the establishment, for instance, of national human rights commissions. So what, what you really need is an infrastructure on the ground. So that um, 
there are people, also professionals, working in those societies who have a clear human rights mandate, an independent mandate, who then can uh, do the capacity building also in close cooperation with the United Nations. There is even there is a unit working in Geneva that helps to establish national human rights institutions and there has been uh, the establishment of quite a number of such institutions in the last years also uh, in Arabic countries. So I know this is not the full answer, but I mean a, a, a question how to how to cope with all these side effects of far-reaching transformation process is something that would clearly be joined a conference like this. I'm sorry for following yeah. There is a case for as young as nine years old. Yeah, of, of course. I mean, that's what, what, can, what can I say? I mean, the obvious answer is, yeah, that's, of course, unacceptable. Of course it's unacceptable. Yeah? But, uh, but then uh, one has to wonder how it... It was possible that such uh, incidents can occur. And so, uh, I mean, it's easy for me to, to make an assessment and say it's unacceptable. What we really need is to look for the root causes and change the structures. Change the structures, which means repeal blasphemy legislation. And that is a, a message which I really want to send here. Blasphemy legislation, I think it's a key. It's not the key for everything, but it is a key. And then, and infrastructural uh, uh, components of human rights work on the ground. I mean, those are not satisfying answers, but are parts of, of an answer. There was a question over here. 